this is Mission Impossible with Nils and John Butler. <laughs> this is our totally non-marketing compliant front slide. Normally we present this with some crazy light show and music, but uh, <laughs> logistics. Cool, and this is the branded one. Uh, cool, so we're going to be talking today about the security of uh, mobile point of sale devices. Um, we'll explain a little bit about, about what they are and about why you would want to use them over traditional, more, you know, larger POS systems. And we're going to discuss the methodology we went about uh, assessing these devices and then the vulnerabilities we found. Um, we've got some, some pretty cool demos. Uh, right. Yes. Cool, so I'll let Nils introduce himself. Yeah, uh, my name is Nils. I'm a security researcher at MWI in the UK. Um, previous research focused on um, mobile systems, specifically Android, and also other payment um, systems, such as uh, two years ago I presented here on um, um, the traditional payment terminals, and um, we did some research into ATMs as well. So yeah, that makes me John. I head up uh, MWR's research in the UK, uh, so everything you see on our kind of lab site. Um, and my background is kind of VonDev and, and reverse engineering, um, and my interests sort of around browser security and sandboxing, as well as obviously um, payment security. Uh, so yeah, we kind of just differentiate between MPOS and, and regular POS systems. So uh, anything which is kind of larger and has a big computer backend is what we consider more traditional POS systems. What we're discussing today is MPOS, which uh, are these kind of little devices here. Um, they're basically small. A uh, little Linux device which you pair with a mobile device and then you can use that combination to make payments, uh, specifically card payments. Um, and these are coming about, I think, because, you know, everything is going mobile and uh, this, is, this is no exception. Uh, the reason why these are interesting is because uh, right now they're kind of being aimed at smaller businesses. So these devices are really cheap. They don't come with a huge uh, contract and setup and that kind of stuff. Um, they are sometimes used by larger companies, uh, but in general these are aimed at consumer market. So one example of people who are, you know, a large company using MPOS devices would be Apple, you know, because not only is that are they cheap, they're also kind of cool, uh, which Apple are obviously all about. Um, so you see when you go into an Apple store and you want to go buy something, they'll just bring an iPad over and, you know, with like a swipe thing. Um, and then they don't need, you know, big registers everywhere and everything can be super cool and minimal. So there's other reasons to use MPOS than they're cheap. And they are definitely out there. So um, if we take a sort of contrived business example, uh, and I don't think he's here to appreciate this one, but uh, some of you might recognize this handsome fellow here. Uh, so say you were selling some very bespoke software, some high value stuff, uh, and traditionally, as you can see in that picture, you know, carrying bags of cash around isn't necessarily the most practical way uh, to take payment for this kind of stuff. So this might be an example where MPOS would be a good idea. Because um, not only do you not have to worry about carrying your bags of cash around, uh, you have a nice portable solution. Um, if you took that as an example, um, if you make very in infrequent payments, then there's no recurring fees. There's a fairly low transaction fee on a, on a per transaction basis. So if he was selling, for example, a timeless Windows XP zero day for the princely sum of about $50,000, you might expect to pay about $750 in transaction fees, which if you weigh that up against carrying a bag full of cash over the border to his fortress of solitude, um, you can imagine that's, that's actually quite an attractive prospect. Um, so over here in the US, you guys uh, still have quite a lot of swipe devices. So the very first kind of attempt at mobile point of sale was actually in the US by a company called Square. Some of you might have seen these devices before or similar ones. Um, essentially, uh, you plug it into the top of your device, so uh, whatever, Android, iOS, um, into the audio socket, and then you swipe a card through it, and it will basically transfer that mag swipe data over audio to the app. Um, then the merchant can use the app to enter the amount and, and do the whole sort of transaction. Um, so we didn't really look at this, because this is basically a mobile skimming device, if you think about it. There's no real security here. You're basically just swiping your card into some dude's phone, and if we know anything about mobile security, that's, that's not a great idea because it's probably not just that app which is listening for that audio. Um, and yeah, you guys uh, in general don't have widespread chip and pin adoption, although that is starting to make its way in slowly. Um, this model has obvious flaws, and, and from our point of view, we didn't really spend any time looking at it because, uh, first of all, in the UK, we have widespread chip and pin adoption, uh, and also we think that this, in general, is not a, a great way to make payments. 
Um, and yeah, so actually, quite recently, Square announced uh, their sort of chip and or almost chip and pin entry to the market. So it has the option to swipe. Um, it also has the option to use a chip if you have a chip card. Um, however, this isn't chip and pin. This is chip and sign. So it's almost getting to the point where it's it's a decent payment, but uh, you still end up identifying the customer based on a signature, which is potentially forgeable. It's certainly a lot easier than if you were to have a, a PIN number to identify a customer against. So they are slowly making their way in here, and I imagine that in a couple of years, you guys will probably all use, all use chip and PIN. Um, so meanwhile, in the first world, um, and you'll see where, <laughs> this is actually the first time we've given this presentation in the US. I really hope we make it out alive. Um, <laughs> so um, we have really, really widespread chip and pin adoption. I, I think we've got some, some stats on that in a couple of slides, like um, literally everywhere else is using chip and pin to some extent. Um, and chip and pin, uh, as a sort of payment uh, works really well. It works even better when you consider MPOS with a standalone terminal because the user has to not only sign something, they have to enter a PIN number. And if you consider if you, something like Square using chip and PIN, you'd have to pass the entire mobile device over uh, and then the customer would basically be holding your phone unlocked and you know, not all customers are, are cool. Um, so having a standalone terminal like this where there's absolutely minimal uh, attack surface and anything that could go wrong basically, uh, short of it running out of battery and you have to charge it again, you know, this is, this is a pretty good um, example of where this model works well. Um, so obviously we went about looking at what you could buy right now because you can buy these things from, from the vendors themselves or from the Apple store. Um, or from just about anywhere. You don't need any kind of special contract. Uh, so we did look at basically everything that was available. Um, we basically just went on a spree and bought as many of these as we could. Um, we found there were a lot of different providers. However, uh, one thing that jumped out of us pretty, pretty quickly is that about 75% of what was available were all using the same underlying platform, even when the outsides didn't necessarily look the same. So um, we were quite surprised by this, and obviously this makes it quite interesting to look into because anything that we do find affects basically all of the market. Um, and this includes the market leader, for example, um, and, and a few others. Um, okay, so we're going to run through some popular brands. You're going to notice, obviously, that we have done a stand-up job of redacting some of these. Um, well, actually, all of these. Uh, and the reason for this is um, guys who take payments don't like things being broken with their payment system. And uh, we're much better at dealing with shellcode than lawyers, to be honest. So uh, we just figured, OK, whatever. Um, so we have a few brands here which we're not going to talk about, but we'll just scroll through quickly. So you'll notice that a lot of these do look quite similar, um, with some notable exceptions. But you can kind of see there's a, there's a, a fairly, fairly common <laughs> And yes, and these, yes. <laughs> so, right, okay, so this, <laughs> we're really good at, at lawyers. Um, so yeah, basically, after looking at, at all of these, um, they all boil down to essentially the same base device, which is the Mura shuttle. And if you go onto their website, you can see this is basically what it looks like. This is kind of their new flashy, we're super cool like Apple, and we've got different colors. But essentially, at the end of the day, these terminals all look roughly the same, and uh, with a few exceptions. That kind of got us onto the idea that perhaps these are, these are all the same device. Um, so of course, we, we had a look at the spec sheet, and essentially, it's just a little Linux device. So it's got an ARM CPU. Um, the interesting thing as well is it's got generic hardware. So when you look at the, the components in here, they're very, very similar to what you might find in, for example, some cheap MP3 players. So this is not what we'd consider specialist hardware. It has some nice specialist features. For example, tamper-proof tamper you wouldn't find on an MP3 player. Um, the things that are mandated by things like PCI um, and, and PTS. Um, but essentially, there's nothing too crazy going on here. It's Linux in a box with a battery and a card slot. Um, so the first thing we did, obviously, to assess these is we wanted to look at how we interact with the thing. We kind of ruled out from the start taking them apart um, because, that's, to be honest with you, that's not really where our specialty lies, and it turns out we didn't have to take these things apart to, to, to get to the innards of them. Um, so we had a look at the interfaces. So the first obvious one is that they take card payments. Now, this is actually something which is overlooked quite a lot. Cards that go into a, a point-of-sale device 
seem to be trusted by people who manufacture these terminals. That's definitely, definitely not the case. Like, we can do whatever we want on the end of that card. It might not make sense to the terminal, but um, you, cer you certainly shouldn't assume that everything that ever goes in one of these came fresh from a bank and no one would ever put, like, any other kind of card in there, for example. And we'll talk about that later, about how we went about um, assessing this interface. They also have MagSwipe, so it's a requirement to fall back to MagSwipe uh, if, the, if the pin fails. They have Bluetooth, so this is the typical way that these terminals connect to a mobile device. And they also have a micro USB port on the side here, which is used mostly for, for charging the device. And so obviously the first thing we did when we got the device is, is to charge them. Um, the docs all say, hey, you, know, you, should just, you should just charge with this, it's fine. However, um, like immediately when we plugged it in, it's all like, yeah, you know, if you want to store some files on me, that's cool. Um, <laughs> so, so we were like, that's really handy. Yeah. Why wouldn't you want that? Um, however, it wasn't going to be that easy, right? Like, you know, just like, let's see, let's see what's on here. It's like pins.txt or something. So yeah, just <laughs> somewhere between it giving up all the goods straight away, but there was definitely something uh, that was worth looking into here. So we thought we would take a look at, at the underlying um, file system, just some quick, real basic forensic stuff. Um, yeah, and on one of the devices, we found that the files that were used to initialize the device from the manufacturer had been deleted, but not, uh, the, you know, the flash storage hadn't been wiped, so essentially, we just DD'd it out into a file and ran Bimwalk on it, and uh, it was basically one just big tar file. Taking that apart, um, that's kind of a partial directory listing of the kind of stuff we found in there. Um, so things of interest would be, uh, they've got some SSL libraries, uh, though I'm not entirely sure when they use them. Um, they have the, um, so the Bluetooth um, libraries that are used for the communication, and they also have this retail API, which is the main payment application on the device that basically drives all the interaction um, with the device. And also they have some like pinbypass.config and that kind of stuff, which actually were less interesting than it sounds. But um, so this was basically a really good way to start looking at the device, because already we had basically a lot of the software which is running on there. It uh, didn't contain any kind of crazy passwords or anything, but it was something that we could load into IDA, because this thing is just an ARM device, and then start taking it apart. Um, so the first thing we looked at is uh, how you would do software updates on these. Now that's one really positive thing about MPOS, and that's a reason why they have this mass storage capabilities. You can update these devices as an end user by dropping a firmware image on there in a special format, rebooting the device, and it has some routines to check. Um, are you a firmware image? Awesome, and then you can update it, which is something that's really missing from a lot of more traditional POS systems, which leaves them to fall behind a bit. Um, the first thing we checked, obviously, is like, okay, can we just put our own code on there, and is it, is that, is it gonna be that easy? Um, but yeah, so they signed their images, and as far as we can tell, this all looks pretty solid from a, from a crypto perspective, so we didn't just get to drop, you know, games on there and, and have fun. Um, however, what we did find is that uh, in analyzing how it does its checking for, for signing, we found uh, some vulnerabilities in, in the code which handles that, and we're gonna demo one of them now on a terminal, let's just make sure that's on. So I should explain how this works. Basically, what we're gonna do is we're gonna plug the terminal in uh, to our, our computer and run the script. The script's gonna copy a few files across which are gonna trigger the vulnerability. Um, but the vulnerability itself actually only gets triggered when you unplug, because the device is listening for an event which is, oh, have you just unplugged the USB? And then it runs a routine to check for, do I have some firmware to update? So I'm gonna plug this in. So the, the script is now copying the files over, which will trigger the vulnerability. You see that the device is mounted in the virtual machine. Um, script is copied over there, and by unplugging the device, the vulnerability will be triggered. If we now plug the device back in, we can now look at the file that has been created. And um, what we executed through that vulnerability is the command uname-a and ID on the system, and you, what you see here is that we're running with, um, in the context of a restricted user, um, and that is the application, the main pa um, payment application on the terminal is running as this user, and that's why the file was created with, um, with access of this user. Yeah. However, um, so that is quite nice, and we saw that's a good start, and then we decided to look at other vulnerabilities that might allow us to um, get a few more privileges on the device. 
So essentially what we're going to do now is run a separate script, which is going to copy a different set of files across to the device. And we'll do the same thing again. We'll unplug it. So that will trigger the, the routine with the vulnerability in it. And when we plug it back in and it remounts, hopefully we should have another very English file name. And now we have code execution as the root user on um, this little embedded Linux device, which then allowed us to have a proper look at everything that is running on the device. Yeah. So this is kind of cool, right? But like as a vector, you can't really go running through the streets saying, oh, it's broken. You know, anyone who walks into a shop tries to make a payment and then has like a USB thing up their sleeve and then plugs it in and then unplugs it and plugs it in again can get like one command executed and that's it. Um, you know, it's, it's nice and it certainly helps us with, um, with taking a look at, at the device, but we wanted to take a look at some of the other interfaces because we acknowledge that USB is kind of obvious when you're tampering with it. Um, but it was very helpful for us in our future research. We could do things like put a copy of GDB server on there, you know, really start doing some runtime analysis and, and take a look at it. So the next thing we took a look at was, uh, was the Bluetooth interface. And actually, the use of Bluetooth there is pretty smart. Um, you get some things for free by using Bluetooth, which they didn't have to bother with. For example, it's pretty hard to sniff Bluetooth, you know, just channel hopping. You have to do pairing first. So, you know, theoretically, no one's going to pair their device with just arbitrary mobile phones and just, you know, because that's a good idea. They should really only do the pairing once, and then once it's done, um, they can just use that. And technically, no one else should be able to, to see that, to take that apart. Um, we're not going to try and break Bluetooth in this presentation. You know, there's been stuff about it before. It's, you know, it's difficult, we think. But uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to see what a paired device can do, because we know that uh, mobile device security can be lacking, and it's not, certainly not out of the question to have a compromised mobile device where the merchant doesn't know that their phone is compromised. And from there, we wanted to see, OK, if you had compromised this mobile device, can you affect the paired terminal with it? Turns out you can. Um, spoiler alert. So um, we basically took apart the, the, the retail API payment application and had a look at what kind of functionality it supported on top of the Bluetooth. So like I said, we're not really looking at Bluetooth as a protocol. On top of that, they had a kind of custom communication protocol that goes over Bluetooth. And we took that apart to see what you can do with it. Um, and yeah, one of the things you can do is file upload along with a lot of the other things you might expect to do over USB. Um, we hypothesize this is probably to allow you to do remote upgrades so you don't always have to upgrade the firmware by plugging it in. You could just go on the mobile app and it says there's a new firmware and you click OK. It will handle all of the transfer. Um, but what that means is that we can trigger the same vulnerability that we found for USB over Bluetooth because we can upload files, which is exactly what we're doing when we plug it in over USB. We're just copying them. Um, so essentially, we wrote an adapted exploit, um, which will trigger this vulnerability. And we just went straight for root this time, because you know, we know we can uh, over Bluetooth. So we're going to demo that now on this device. <laughs> so this device, where we had to redact the name as well, let's call it PayFriend. Um, so the Bluetooth exploit will trigger the up, uh, update functionality and use the same vulnerability that we demonstrated through USB before. Um, in order to get code execution on the device. So the, the update will be triggered immediately. And now we can open another Bluetooth connection to the device, just an RFCOM address already used. And through this Bluetooth connection now we have. So that is the uh, modem plug and play in Linux, which is screwing with the terminal a little bit. But <laughs> come on. Come on. <laughs> uh, so what you, what you now can see is that we have arbitrary code execution as a root user on the device. And we can now have a proper look at the device. We can upload our own ARM compiled GDB server to the debugging of the main um, uh, payment application to look at um, any other vulnerabilities and more details that we might find. And um, also, so what is interesting about this vulnerability, if an attacker has access to a mobile device, let's say an insecure Android device, uh, which is compromised already, they can use the Bluetooth connection then to compromise the mobile payment um, um, systems as well. And so if you look at it from a merchant's point of view, let me just cover this for a sec, um, all you see is it's just got a nice blue light on it, a friendly blue light, which is exactly what you would see if you were using it when it's paired to a device. So there's not, nothing, nothing crazy here. We're not 
being not trigger any kind of suspicious activity. This just looks exactly as it is when it's communicating over Bluetooth with a mobile device, which is in, in essence what we're doing here. Okay, so now we have uh, code execution as a root user on the dev device with an interactive shell. We can do some GDB debugging on there as well, which is all pretty straightforward on an Im embedded Linux system. So we now decided to look at other attack surfaces that, that might exist. And the most interesting one for us is obviously EMV, because an, an exploit in the EMV library on that device would allow us to just use a malicious card, theoretically, to compromise uh, the payment terminal and then take control over the payment terminal. Um, so EMV is the de facto standard for uh, card payments, um, so for chip and pin card payments, but also for ch uh, chip and signature um, um, payments. And the EMV standard um, requires the vendors of these devices to, to get uh, certified for their devices. Um, but these certifications mostly be, um, focus on interoperability between the different cards and all the cards that are out there and the, and the terminals that get certified. Um, interestingly, the, the standard doesn't really have any requirements regarding security of these EMV kernels. And that demonstrates how a lot of people just accept the, uh, the smart cards to be part of the trusted system for chip and pin payments. Um, so we applied the um, same EMV testing methodology which we have um, used against t two years ago, for example, against payment terminals, but we have used um, similar methodology against ATMs as well. Uh, so we have a programmable smart card, um, and then we initiate a part of an EMV transaction, and at any point in the EMV transaction, we um, just deliver malformed um, data. Yeah, basically fuzzing the EMV implementation. However, it's very slow fuzzing of the EMV impl implementation because you have to go st to the state where it accepts the payment, and then you, you insert the next test case into the device, and then you see whether it crashes or not, and then you go back and reprogram the card with the next test case, and so on. So it, it takes a while, um, but it is quite useful when, when looking at EMV implementations. Um, EMV is quite an interesting protocol. Um, when you look at it, it ha is far more complex than many people um, think it is. Um, there was a presentation on chip and pin by, by Ross Anderson um, this morning, and you will have seen in there that, yeah, it is a, a very complex protocol. Um, most of the information stored on the card consists of uh, text, so the information is stored in text. There's a, a list of all of the noun text on emvlab.org, which is also a very good reference for the EMV protocol. And these texts are stored in the TLV um, format. So it first tells you what kind of information is stored. Then it has a length and a value. So the length of the value is stored in there. And that is kind of similar to, for example, other protocols or formats like, for example, ASN1. And we all know that um, there's nothing that can go wrong with ASN1 parsing, right? So the, these implementations, or well, many of these implementations we have found to be very prone to um, uh, memory corruption vulnerabilities. And most of these, especially when they are running on small embedded devices, will be implemented in C or C++. So um, yeah, there's a good potential for vulnerabilities in there. Um, after a bit of testing, we found a, a stack-based buffer overflow in the parsing of the EMB protocol, um, even though it uses a fairly recent Linux kernel. It doesn't make any use of the uh, of any exploitation mitigation techniques that you might um, be able to get on, on Linux. So there's no NX, there's no um, ASLR. And um, actually, the bug that we are exploiting is very similar to uh, a bug that we found on a different terminal by a different vendor with different code um, on the traditional POS terminals. Um, so back then, when we did the demonstration in 2012, we demonstrated the game on one of the uh, traditional um, payment terminals, uh, um, a small racing game on these terminals. So nowadays, exploits have to be entertaining. They have to be marketed properly. So um, we decided to do something similar um, with this demonstration. And Flappy Bird, at the time of the implementation of our demonstration, Flappy Bird was very popular. So we decided to, to use that for um, the demonstration purposes. Um, so for that, we've got a webcam connected to our laptop. Let me just try to bring that up. Just careful. Is that yeah, plugs in. Okay, now. Cool. Try to. Okay. 
Okay, I think the VM has taken a USB device. Son of a... <laughs> Just bear with us a second. Hard luck, huh? So we've got our programmable smart card over here, just a white card. It's a, um, a basic card. Um, some of you might be familiar with Java card. Basic cards are um, fairly simple to that concept. Um, uh, they come with a very good IDE as well, so that you, you really quickly get started with, with those basic cards and get to something useful. Um, what we have to do in our demonstration is, um, because we don't want to use an actual payment application from one of the vendors um, uh, of these devices, because that would actually mean we have to start a transaction, and some of our EMV data might be sent to their back end, and we really don't want to do anything that would give them any ammunition. Um, so we have implemented a quick script, which is just replaying the same kind of communication that a mobile device does with the device to put it into a, um, into a payment state. Yeah. I'm going back to the video capture now. And now you see what, what's on the screen. It just asks you to um, enter the card. So it says waiting for card. Cool. Um, okay. So we in insert our... Um, yeah, this is a, like a three-man job. <laughs> All right. Cool. So, so that, that will continue the, the payment. And the next step that you see is it asks you to enter the PIN. So um, of course. Well, obviously, you're supposed to shield your PIN. <laughs> it's not important. So by pressing the green button, we accept that. And now we have triggered, at this stage, we have triggered our vulnerability. But because our second stage is a bit more complex, it takes a while to start. And what you see now on the screen, can we? Who's playing? I'm going to get more than zero. So it's, uh, it's a bit hard to read. It says Chippy Pin by MW Labs, okay. which is our version of Flappy Bird. This is by far the most nerve wracking bit of the presentation. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> Let's get one. Oh. <laughs> All right, OK, come on. So you, you have to get at least one. I don't know if any of the Vupin guys are here, but they played this for hours and didn't get any. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, learn to write exploits, guys. Yeah, so John holds the current record with ten, yeah. I think. Nine. I want double. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so um, yeah, we can. Um, the nice thing about this exploit is uh, we kind of unnecessarily used some ROP gadgets. We didn't have to, obviously, but that does make it cross device. Uh, so we have a bunch of devices with us, and if we finish redacting them all uh, really poorly. Uh, we might have a little bit of a tournament later. So if anyone's interested in, in having a little game, uh, please do. Current high score is nine if you get double digits. Feel free to tweet about it. If you don't, it never happened, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. I have my evidence. Okay. So um, even though we're just um, demonstrating on this, uh, in this demonstration that we have a game running on the device, there's several interesting bits to this. So on the one side, you see we have full access over the screen. So whatever is seen by the merchant or customer on the screen, we control now. Remember, we have root access to the device, so um, quite a lot of access. Um, and we can also control the keypad. So we only use the green button, but we can actually read all of the keys um, unscrambled and get the input as well. So if we now would forge a payment application um, which asks for payments, we would be able to control the screen and also read any input on the, um, into the pin pad. Um, the, the exploit, as I said, is a fairly simple stack-based buffer overflow. Uh, we only used one static address uh, in um, one library, which is the same on all of the devices that we have seen so far. So very stable, works across um, all of the, the devices that we tested, apart from uh, this PayFriend device where um, they don't have a screen on the device. So it probably works, but we can't confirm that. Uh, the whole shell code is 180 bytes. Uh, it retrieves a second stage from the smart card. Smart cards actually have a lot more storage than you might think. Um, so in this case, a 4K uh, tarball from, um, from the device that then executes a script. Um, and that script runs the second stage, which is just a compiled ARM binary, which replaces the main payment application. So now the interesting question is, what would an attacker do? As I said, um, well, it's probably not in their interest to play a game on those devices. Um, they are more likely to 
go after any monetary bene uh, benefit when, when attacking those devices. So the pin pen, as you have seen, it only takes one I.O. control to put it from the secure mode where the operating, isn't operating system isn't able to read the input into the insecure mode, and we have full control over the screen. One of the most likely attacks that we think is uh, viable against those devices is to just display after the pin has been entered, so for all of the following transactions, uh, a try again message, um, switch the pin pad into the insecure mode, and then capture the pin when it is entered. Um, you can also display a message which asks the customer to fall back to um, max swipe swipes, and you can, just by reading the uh, slash dev slash max swipe device, you get all of the information that is entered through that. So now an attacker would be able to turn that device into a skimming device without any physical evidence on, on the device at all. Other modifications an attacker could do. They could change the terminal to accept any card that is entered. Just ignore whatever the card returns when you try to verify a pin against the terminal and basically turn this terminal into a yes terminal. And after an attacker exploits a vulnerability like this, they would now be able to use stolen cards, which are actually quite hard to use in, uh, in Europe or other places that use chip and pin. And they could turn these devices into devices that accept these malicious cards. Um, another interesting way we, where we did some research into as well is um, we now have a fully compromised terminal. It would be interesting if an attacker could um, attack the mobile device as well, because that immediately, um, so a trusted connection to the mobile device already exists, and now the terminal could use the mobile device um, to get an internet connection for command and control, for example, to send off all, all of the information that is out there. Um, and they also get the view, control of the view of the merchant, which allows for um, many other attacks as well. Um, that would require vulnerability in the uh, Bluetooth protocol parsing on the mobile device side. Um, so we briefly looked at that. Um, all six terminals, um, um, so for four of those terminals, we found that they use the same standard protocol. Um, so the protocol we just replayed against this device is used on most of the devices. However, two of the devices decided to implement their own um, protocol. Um, the implementation we have seen so far um, so five of those were implemented in Java on Android, so that's far less likely to have any exploitable vulnerabilities just through the Bluetooth protocol. One was in the implemented nat uh, in native code, which looked a little dodgy in one place, um, <laughs> but because they were sending everything that was put into the device, also everything that was coming back, or almost everything from the device, they sent onto their backend systems, and as soon as you remove the internet connection, and that would fail, um, we weren't too keen to test that and to see whether that works because that might affect um, the vendor systems as, as well. The iOS implementation, so you would think that the, the vendor of these devices gives out an implementation to uh, the, um, their customers and for, for using the Bluetooth protocol. Interestingly, all of the implementations are different, are customly made by the vendors. Um, they are mostly implemented in Objective-C with varying degrees of plain C in, in this code. So there's um, and, and interestingly, there's quite a varying quality of those implementations. So some of them make heavy use of string copy, others don't. So there, there's definitely some potential for this attack to work. Um, when we reported last year, we, we started reporting those vulnerabilities to the vendor. Um, they were um, surprisingly open to, to our input. Um, they worked with us um, on a full code review as well. So usually we wouldn't mention clients here, but they um, allowed us uh, to do that in this case. Um, so, yeah, they, um, they hardened the software against m many of the attacks that we found. So as we have seen, a lot of the vulnerabilities that we have found in this case were vulnerabilities which we usually wouldn't expect on the desktop or server market anymore, hopefully. Um, so they had some ca catching up to do. Um, they released new versions which address all of these issues to their um, third-party vendors in April this year. Uh, However, we, we don't know how many of the third-party vendors have applied those patches to their own systems and actually have pushed out patches to the vendors. Also one reason why we couldn't include the full details of the vulnerabilities um, in this presentation. So there are unfortunately are still vulnerable devices out there which are not getting patched uh, just now. 
Um, so conclusion from this talk is um, the approach of using a separate terminal for the pin entry is very promising. Um, we think it's the only way to do secure payments. It's a bit unfortunate that on some of these systems the implementation is not as good as the concept behind it. Um, we have seen many basic vulnerabilities which we thought should be addressed by now, but um, the same vulnerabilities that we have been exploiting in, in the 90s still apply to, to some of these systems. Um, but th that's exactly what we have seen with traditional terminals as well. So the, the software quality, uh, quality on those terminals uh, was quite appalling as well. Um, with the introduction of these new systems, it's important to get the implementation right um, um, early on so that people don't lose trust in these systems, especially when the US is now moving away from Mac Stripe swipe as well. Um, that will lead attackers to look at other opportunities to commit fraud against card payments as well. And um, it is uh, fairly likely that they will le level up in skills as well and not um, when they are unable to go after Mac Stripe as easily anymore. Um, what was also quite interesting when, when we were working with the vendor, we saw that um, EMV and the other standards are not really well defined so that security vulnerabilities can be, um, can be addressed, in, uh, addressed in a timely manner. So all of these devices have to go through a recertification when a new patch is, um, uh, is pushed out or is about to be pushed out to these devices, and that actually took the most time um, for, for getting these vulnerabilities ad addressed. So maybe um, these organizations could work, could put some work into um, being able to address security vulnerabilities more quickly. Any questions? Okay, so the, the question is, um, this is the second time we demonstrate uh, smart card vulnerabilities in payment terminals, and the question is, uh, how many of these cards have we seen in the world, or do, do, basically do we have any evidence for this happening in the world? And um, as far as we are aware, and also by talking to people in the industry, this is not currently done by any criminals or exploited by any criminals. Obviously, it would be hard to figure out in a forensic inv investigation, because when the device is reset, um, everything will be back to normal. Um, so, but to, to our knowledge, it's not currently being exploited in the world. Any other, other questions? Cool, thanks very much. Thank you.